What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Monday, November 4th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. We're one day away from the election, folks. 10 can't miss election predictions by our good friend Robert Rice. Next up, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, Iran oil sanctions failure. Next up, billions pouring into UK renewables. Finally, Leiden Basel to shut down Houston refinery. Not great. Stu will then quickly cover the breaking news here as we record this on a Sunday that OPEC Plus has agreed to delay December output hike for one month, according to two sources he will then toss it over to me i will quickly cover what's happening in the oil and gas markets mainly some interesting stuff that's happening via friday where we saw prices up then we saw it down we'll quickly cover rig counts which didn't really do much and then the big three conoco exxon and chevron all announced were earnings we will cover briefly all of that and a bag of chips guys as always i am michael tanner joined by Stuart Turley. Where do you want to begin? Hey, let's start with our election going on here. 10 can't miss Wait, wait, there's election. an election? Election. For our podcast listeners, I'm sitting here with my trusty, dusty, uh, black Trump hat. But here is a thing. This is a story from our beloved Robert Bryce over on his Substack. 10 can't miss election predictions. And this is an outstanding. If you want to roll through them for us here, let us know what these are. Yeah, yeah. So let's just scroll through the 10, then we'll dive into a few that we want to do. First up, the vote tally will show again the urban-rural divide. Wow, really going out on a limb there, Robert, but that's fine. <laughs> Next up, if Trump wins, he won't repeal the alt-energy subsidies in the Inflation Reduction Act. Interesting there. If Harris wins, the anti-industry industry will even have more power. That's number three. Number four, if Trump wins, the LNG export ban will end immediately. Interesting there. We talked a little, I talked a little bit about that in my solo show last week. Number five, if Trump wins, the offshore wind business will be headed for Davy Jones Locker. Interesting there. Unfortunately, we'll be the whale population will be pumped about that one. Number six, regardless of who wins, permitting reform is going nowhere. Number seven, the EPA EV mandates will be scrapped. Number eight, the rejection of wind and solar across rural America will continue. Number nine, regardless of who wins, the reliability of the U.S. electric grid will keep declining. Spooky stuff there. Then finally, number 10 for Robert Bryce, regulatory uncertainty and project delays will persist in the electric sector for many years to come. All right, Stu, let's dive into a few of these. Where do you want to start? Uh, let's start here. Let's start with number seven. I want to start with uh, this one. The EPA's EV mandates will be scrapped. EPA, EPA ma uh, mandate on electric vehicles is a massive overreach by the administrative state. And I'll tell you, what this election is really bringing forth is people are fed up with being forced into this EV mandate. It's going to just go away. Now, uh, regardless of who wins, this one scares me. This is number six. Permitting reform is going nowhere. That one makes me air sick. I'm hoping that Trump, if Trump wins, Trump can sick Elon on it and just eliminate 80% of government. That I'm hopeful for. The offshore, if Trump, number five, if Trump wins, the offshore business will be headed for Davy Jones locker and the whales went, yeah. Um, I, I think that we're seeing that around the world, except in the UK. Got a story on that later here. Yeah, the LNG ban is critical for if Trump wins, the LNG ban will go on. And, and I'll tell you what, it really breaks my heart that we can't support our business partners around the world by supplying all the LNG we, we want. We got to give them LNG. So I, I'm happy that drill, baby, drill, and let's get rid of that LNG ban. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with, with most of these. You know, obviously with the Chevron deference Supreme Court ruling, I think, as you talked about, number seven, the EPA's EV mandates will be scrapped. I mean, it's going to be hard to enforce them now that that's really not the case anymore. You talked about in your solo show last week, Ford losing $11 billion on its EV 
as he calls it in this article, misadventure, which is pretty funny, and that includes $1.2 billion in the third quarter alone, which is pretty right. unbelievable. The whales will be pumped if we do start getting rid of the <laughs> offshore wind. I think we're just going to start seeing left offshore wind regardless because it's not necessarily bearing any monetary fruit. And again, that's the key with all this stuff. Over the long term, the fr- the the profit and loss will prevail. In the short term, it won't. In the short term, people will do what they want. They'll hand wave. They'll, you know, so they can show up to dinner parties and pretend they're cool. But over the long term, profit and loss will essentially rule the day. And so that's why, again, I think offshore wind is doomed. Number nine is spooky. Regardless of who wins, the reliability of the U.S. electrical kit will keep declining. That's scary from the standpoint of it doesn't matter who wins. We're, we're about to fall off a cliff with the grid. We need to do something about it now. I hate to say the answer is spend more government money, but I don't see how else we fix this. You get, you've got to rein in the uh, renewable waste because in his cumulative U.S. wind and solar rejections to 2015 to 2024, that will help a bunch. 745 rejection from projects. People are quitting and they don't want these things in their neighborhoods. So yeah, as, no, as I mean, people- the, the fact when you have the FERC commissioner who's using the term, quote, catastrophic to describe the state of the U.S. energy grid, that should tell us all we need to know about. If we're going to spend money and a lot of government money on the energy you know, energy in general, the grid should be the first place we look. Um, I'll tell you what, though. I who know, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, I think we all ho- hopefully Trump wins. But regardless, I, it's, it's going to be tight. And I doubt as w- when we record this on Tuesday, we'll know who actually wins. Um, I have, I already know who's going to win, but of course you, of course you do. You, 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 your, your, your Reddit thread told you. Got it. Got it. Got it. All right. Hey, let's go to Joe Biden and Kamala's Iran oil sanctions failure. You can't buy this kind of failure. Iran's oil sector remains vital in funding its campaign against Israel and the Western powers as a linchpin in Tehran's relationship with Beijing. They have successfully driven Iran into working very closely with Putin and China. So you want to talk about stupidity. President Biden has not officially repealed any oil sanctions against Iran. But then again, Iran has not officially exported any oil to China. Hogwash. They're the largest buyer. This is just nuts. Anyway, it, they're not they're not enforcing it, and it's a failed, complete process. I thought it was a great article by Dr. Ariel Cohen. Well, yeah, I mean, it's clear since, I mean, she points out in this article since 2020, Iran's oil revenue from exports has quadrupled from $16 billion to $53 billion in 2023. And that's according to the EIA, which they've got every exactly. incentive to make it look as slim as possible. You know, obviously, and, you know, she points out three reasons, the, the, the lax enforcement of these sanctions. Obviously, there's a rise in global oil prices, which is going to raise revenue. So it's not quite just an apples to apples comparison. China has also come in and decided they they want to import and basically have oil on tap and have really strengthened that relationship with Iran, which is absolutely scary. And that's really what we're seeing now that Iran being flushed with cash. You see what's happening right now in the Middle East. It totally devastated the Middle East. All right, let's go to pouring billions into UK renewables. Michael, I'm just going to brag on us here for you and I for a second. We have found over the last four years, the either the Turley law, the more money that is spent on renewable energy, the more fossil fuels will be used is a law that we are finding the holding fact. The UK's new labor government is aggressively pursuing green energy ad- agenda with significant investments in renewable projects and supportive policies. They are failing. The UK's largest expo- electricity supplier, Octopus Electric Electri- Energy, has launched a new initiative to offer consumers a discount so their energy bills during times of favorable conditions, like three in the morning, for renewable energy production. No, just when I need all my energy is at three in the morning. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, absolutely. The the conservatives 
destroyed the UK, and then the left-wing nut jobs are finishing it. I feel sorry for them. But Germany, the UK, New York, New Jersey, and California are the foundation for our law. The more you spend on renewables, the more you will spend on fossil fuels. No, it's it's true. You know, they keep touting all of this quote unquote private investment, yet they keep having all needing all of this public subsidies to come in on it. It's it's pretty unbelievable. I love your analogy. The conservatives started it and now the 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 Labor Party is finishing it all off. I mean, again, I, I think what you're seeing going on in, in the United Kingdom is is they're trying to they've they've set all this rhetoric about how they need to go green climate change is killing us and now they're forced to back it up and whether and and which means they're not going to look at the underlying data about what's happening electricity prices right. are up you think with electricity prices as high as they are in the united kingdom they'd be like wait a second maybe maybe we shouldn't necessarily be just turning off our most reliable sources of energy but again it's all it's all rhetoric now and and they and right. they want to look good at their little at they want to look good at the pub and not necessarily have lower energy but the problem is you keep raising energy prices your pubs going out of business so exactly. really the, the campaign should be save the pubs lower electrical costs those need to be and, t-shirts oh that would be a great t-shirt save the pubs and the whales hey let's go to Lendl Basil the shut down Houston refinery the Industries has announced that it plans to close its Houston refinery, making the end of nearly 100 years of operations for the Gulf Coast facility. This is from Nathan Hammer Substack. I got to give him a shout out. Uh, he's been just starting to write some really good articles. Capacity is 264,000 barrels per day, gasoline, diesel, and other petroleum. But Michael, they said they're looking to repurpose this after the first of the year to something with more green potential. I'm over here and I sent Nathan a note. What do you mean? <laughs> There's nothing here. This is, they're just going to let it sit there. I think the regulations got to them. Yeah, well, I mean, with, with Chevron obviously getting out of California and now moving towards moving to Texas. We saw Mike Worth announce that on and CNBC. Phillip 66 last week. is closing yep. theirs in California. You're, you're going, you know, eventually oil slick Newsom over there is going to realize that he's really slipped hard in turn. He'd be probably wetted his hair a little bit too much, a little bit slipped on the, oh. a little bit leaked on the floor. And then he slipped and tripped. And now all of a sudden when he wakes up and comes out of his coma, he'll realize, wait, there's no energy in this state. And he's going to again be buying it from overseas, buying it from places that aren't necessarily the United States where again, we have the cleanest energy in the world gets produced in the United States. Um, so I think it's it's unbelievable what's going on in California. Obviously, with this Houston refinery closing, it's it's probably it's a little bit more. The, the Houston refinery, I think, has a little bit more to do with just the overall economics of the refinery, not necessarily the underlying you know, an underlying shift away. Obviously, Houston refiners aren't going anywhere. So it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's was a phased, it's, you know, this has been in the works for a while, didn't just all of a sudden just pop up. But it does show you that investment is still needed in the downstream sector. And if, we're spending all the money on offshore wind farms. If the regulatory system allowed them to upgrade this through the years and made the tax incentives for them, this thing would be just moving right along. So I'm going to I'm going to hold it to it. Let's go to OPEC. Yes. OPEC agrees to delay December output hike for one month. Good grief. This is you breaking news as we sat down to record this. Oh, absolutely. OPEC has agreed to delay a planned December oil output by one month. Three sources told Reuters on Sunday uh, the organization was scheduled to raise 180,000 barrels per day in December, and it's already delayed that increase because of falling prices. Michael, I find that pretty interesting. What is interesting is that, you know, last month we heard coming out of OPEC that they're abandoning their $100 oil price target and want to ride the market down as they go. The problem right. is that while that may be true, they're spending an awful lot of money, specifically in Saudi Arabia, attempting to diversify away from oil and gas. So it's this catch-22. In order to diversify away from oil and gas revenue, 
Well, they need oil prices as high as they can get so they can right. suck enough revenue off, turn around and invest that in other things, and then hopefully you know, over the next 10 to 15 years wean themselves from 90% oil and gas revenue from right. a government budget standpoint, although you know maybe down to something more reasonable, which I don't know what a reasonable number would be. I mean, you're sitting on the world's largest oil deposits. You'd like to think that's where most of your money is going to be made. But this was interesting yeah, because I think you were hearing, hearing chatter on both sides, the fact that they went ahead and and have decided to delay this tells me that they're worried that prices could continue to fall or they're worried of a Trump victory in which the United States oil supply will immediately increase due to the fact that regulations will be a little bit more relaxed. And most likely, people are just going to start drilling more because of the, the sentiment around that. Now, that could be wrong. We could see oil prices steady. I think that's probably what you're seeing here, a combination of both. But the fact that they're not going to, they're going to roll, not roll back, but keep the cuts in place signals that they're worried about prices falling even further. And it'd be interesting right. from, from this angle to know why they think that. Well, in the uh, article, it does say the remaining OPEC plus cuts of 3.66 million barrels per day will remain in place through the end of 2025. We'll find out some more after December December 1st. We'll know more about how smooth the transition of power goes. Yeah, pretty crazy. <laughs> so, well, let's jump over and talk a little finance, guys, before we do that. As always, we got to pay the bills around here. This, uh, all the news and analysis, quote unquote analysis that you just heard, um, is brought to you by the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Go ahead and hit the description below for all links to the timestamps, links to the articles. You can also check us out on Substack, theenergynewsbeat.substack.com. We've actually now turned on monitoring monetization on that, which means you get two weeks of trailing free articles. But if you want to go back in the archives, you've got to sign up. So if you're interested in going back into the archives and reading all of our stuff, guys, make sure to sign up for a paid subscription on Substack. You guys, everyone who has signed up already, we really appreciate that. I mean, you just help us continue to bring you more stuff. Stu's going to be starting to write a lot more articles that are going to be most likely behind that paywall. So again, if you want access to that, sign up for a subscription there. We really appreciate everybody there. You can also hit our description below and, and check out investinoil.energynewsbeat.com. Guys, if you are paying taxes in 2024, you're an idiot. Just say it out loud. If you are paying taxes as a high net worth individual in 2024, you need to get on the oil and gas bandwagon in terms of it is the best place to lower your overall adjusted gross income so that you cannot pay money to the federal government so they can dump it into offshore wind. You can keep that money in your pocket Get a little bit of a dividend and achieve some portfolio diversification. Get yourself and out save of the whales. Yeah, save the whales. Invest in oil and gas. That <laughs> there's a t-shirt right there, folks. Okay, invest in oil and gas. Save the whales. Again, taxes are so 2023. In 2024, we're avoiding taxes by investing in oil and gas, achieving some <laughs> monthly dividends, and getting some portfolio diversification. If you want more info, invest in oil. Or at the bottom of any one of our articles, you can fill out our oil and gas portfolio survey. We will get you all the information on how to do that, guys. Check out the description below. We will also be recording kind of a dual show Tuesday. As you guys know, we we record kind of a the, the night before release in the mornings. But with the election going on Tuesday, we'll we'll, pro we'll do a quick segment by Tuesday afternoon. Obviously, I mean, I don't know what's going on on Tuesday. I think there's something big going on Tuesday, Stu. What is it? The election. I, yeah. Wait until something's clear at night and then drop back on and do a little bit of a, a follow-up piece based on the election results. If we know it, we'll probably bring on some friends of the show to have a little discussion with a bunch of other people. So check right. out our election uh, special, which will be coming. Uh, you'll hear it on Wednesday, but we will be recording that on Tuesday. So we appreciate everybody checking us out. But let's dive into finance here, guys. You know, prices for oil and gas actually a little spicy on Tuesday. But before we cover that, let's just look at the overall markets here. You know, S and P five hundred was was up about four tenths of a percentage point, still sitting at all time highs for the S and P five hundred. We've had massive rip throughout the year, forty percent on the S and P five hundred year over year or uh, this year. So absolutely unbelievable. Nasdaq was up about three seven tenths of a percentage point. Two and ten year yields uh, were up 0.9 percentage points. 
and the 10-year was up 2.33 percentage points. Yikes! That's not good. Dollar index, four-tenths of a percentage point. The s and Bitcoin actually dropped about 1.3 percentage points over the weekend. It's now below 70,000 at 68,424 as we record this. Oil had a pretty crazy day on Friday. It was up all the way above 71 after a huge jump, mainly off the fact that Iran now is planning to reattack Israel, which is funny because they came out and said they wouldn't attack. That drove prices all the way up to a little above 71 before falling and closing at 69.33. That's, excuse me, 69.49. That is, uh, you know, basically where we see the open happening. I think it's interesting that this little tit for tat that's going on, that's most likely where, I mean, so what's going on there in the Middle East too? We've got, you know, Israel attacked Iran. They didn't go after any of the oil uh, infrastructure, the nuclear infrastructure, which is probably good considering what kind of global tensions were going to happen. Iran immediately came out and said they weren't going to respond, but now they're responding. What are you hearing? Well, I'd like to know what deals were made between Netanyahu and Biden, since Biden, I'm not sure he knows where he actually is in this world. And why? Because Netanyahu was mad that they had the release of the information from Politico about their attack. So evidently, we've promised some additional things. I think that we still will see an attack. Now, the fact that we have Iran having their spare or their secondary port opened up and is now functional, you know, I don't know. But there have there's definitely some things in the background going on. Yeah, no, definitely. That's really what's driving prices. We did see rig counts get updated on Friday. No, no change week over week. Let me go and throw that picture up there. We've got 588 rigs, which was the same as last week. Still down 33 from last year, but that 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 gap is now closing as we're kind of kind of coming in on that yearly track. I mean, I imagine in a, a month or two we'll probably be at last year's levels because as we continue to dive, things happen. Canada dropped three rigs. International picked up. Three rigs. The only other thing I saw, you know, we saw on Thursday, Friday, Stu, was uh, the big three, our, our, our big integrated oil and gas companies, Exxon, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, reported earnings. Conoco and, and Exxon actually dropped relative to, you know, actually dropped relative to where their earnings came in. Chevron was up hard. Nothing really interesting in those earnings other than Exxon and Chevron both beat analyst profit output and sales estimates, mainly off the back of rising Permian production. Exxon in the third quarter exceeded expectations that were expected by analysts by about a nickel, and while Chevron per surpassed by about 11 cents. Um, you know, I think I, I can't really, you know, really why Exxon fell was the fact that they're, they're, they're the, the delays in what's happening in Guyana, you know, they're, the mm -hmm. expectation was that they were continued to increase production. We didn't quite see as much of an increase in production relative to what was expected. So again, I think that's, that's really what, what hampered them just on the stock market side. Both did raise their dividend. You know, what's funny is, you know, I think, X, I think Chevron had the worst quarter, um, but they were the one, they were up two percentage points on Friday and, and Chevron mm -hmm. was down or, and Exxon was down. What I find funny is that they're dipping into the debt markets in order to pay in in order to do some some buybacks and that actually was a point of contention if you go read the uh the earnings call Citigroup analysts was wondering why is their distributions as high as they are if they're having to reach into debt to do that um you know basically uh, Mike Worth came out and said hey you know it, you know we've got production rising we've got a 10% year over year free cash flow growth over the next 10 years which Again, it, a lot of that they're baking into that is the Hess Guyana acquisition. And if they don't get that, that could, I don't know where that 10% comes other than assuming they're going to win the arbitration between Exxon, Hess, and Shet and, 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 and themselves. If they don't get that, it's going to be very interesting to see where they land. You know, while. You know, he does acknowledge and he does come out and say that the, the arbitration has been a drag on Chevron stock, but he's confident they're going to prevail. Better hope so, because a lot of that 10 percent free cash flow growth is baked into them acquiring those Guyana assets. So it could be pretty interesting. You know, he did. I love this quote from him. He took a he took a pretty big swing at California. Uh, here's the quote. Putting bureaucrats in charge of centrally planning key segments of the economy economy hasn't worked in other socialist states, I doubt it will be any different in California. Woo! Shots fired! Oh, couldn't have to do a nicer idiot. No, good. No. Friend of the show, Ga Governor Gavin Newsom. Welcome on the show anytime. 
Oh, um, absolutely. Not- uh, equal time. Yeah, equal <laughs> equal time. Yeah. Cause we're on we're 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 privately funded, so we have to do it that. And and poorly privately funded. Um <laughs> all right, Stu, what else you got? Um it's gonna be it's a big week. Finally, we'll we'll have our election special on Tuesday, and then I promise you guys we're gonna take a month off from talking anything politics. I've been I wanna shoot myself in the head. You can't watch sports without seeing ads for all this. I, I feel sorry for all the people that actually watch mainstream media. Uh, and some of the Harris campaign ads seeing a Republican in there it just are horrific. I can't believe that that woman is that is doing that. It's pretty sad. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I, I just I know for me, I'm just burnt out. I'm ready to go back to to, to normality here. Get back to uh, what's going on. But it will be it. interesting. What's up? I hope we make it. I think we will. I think we will. So mark my words. I think we will make it unless the Reddit threads are right, which generally the Reddit threads are wrong. But we'll see. Um, anything else, Stu? I would say, what should people be worried about this week? But I think people already know what they should be worried about. Uh, Just keep your head on a swivel and pray. And let's pray for a peaceful outcome. Absolutely, guys. Whatever happens will happen. Well, with that, guys, we'll let you get out of here. Get back to work. Start your Monday. We appreciate everybody's checking us out here on the World's Greatest Podcast. For Stuart Turner, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.